Good afternoon. May I extend a warm welcome to everyone who is participating in this webinar ahead of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, better known as COP26, that begins in Glasgow later this month. I'm delighted that we are joined by representatives from five international partner jurisdictions. And while we may differ geographically, we share a common commitment to leveraging our strengths to meet global climate cha change and overcome the challenges to carbon neutrality. We have convened this group to discuss our individual climate change challenges and share our jurisdictional objectives. In 2019, the States Assembly, that's our Parliament, declared a climate emergency and plans are already underway to set Jersey on an ambitious carbon reduction trajectory with an aim to be carbon neutral by 2030. Ambitions like this are more important than ever as we face the real and tangible impacts of climate change on our daily lives and on our communities. This is especially true of island communities facing the threat of rising sea levels. That is why COP26 is a critical opportunity for global leaders to meet and to commit to immediate, coordinated and lasting action on climate change. I very much hope to attend COP26 and would like to extend an invitation to all the other members here for us to meet whilst in Glasgow. It would be beneficial to continue the conversations we have started today and to share our experience and knowledge at a political level. All nations have responsibility, including small islands, to do their part. I know there is an appetite for a joint policy response following this webinar, and we will be issuing a communique to demonstrate our commitment to combating climate change as a group of small islands. Though we are geograph small geographically, we can demonstrate readily that we can be leaders who are willing to take big policy decisions in the interests of our planet. I'd like to discuss one other program of work. Jersey has an ambitious green finance vision. As a leading international finance centre managing over £1 trillion of assets, Jersey is committed to greening its financial ecosystem. Jersey has developed a two-year roadmap. This aims to deliver in partnership with the financial services sector the transition of Jersey to become a leading sustainable international finance centre and to develop products and new services to enable private global capital, which is managed in Jersey, to be mobilised into low-carbon, sustainable and climate-resilient global development. We are committed to ensuring that our finance sector's activities are aligned to the goals of the Paris Agreement. In addition, the JFSC, that's our regulator, introduced greenwashing disclosure rules this year in respect of funds and investment advisory activities, which are promoted as offering an ESG impact. These rules apply to all certified funds, Jersey private funds, fund services business providers and advisory investment business providers in respect of funds or investments that are held out as being sustainable investments. Jersey also mobilises private capital via private equity and venture capital funds to invest in green projects to power a low carbon future. Examples include the Quinbrook Low Carbon Power Fund, the Foresight Solar Fund, the Alpha Wind Renewables Income Fund and the VLC Renewables Fund. Through looking closely at our jurisdictional strengths and working closely with our largest industry, we can find practical ways like this to adapt our offering to meet global climate challenges. I'm sure that through our discussions today, we will see practical examples of other jurisdictions taking these steps putting climate responsibility at the heart of our economies. I'd now like to introduce a short video by the Jersey Electricity Company on Jersey's commitment to decarbonise and the electrification 
of our energy supply. Climate change is the greatest threat to our planet and life as we know it. And time is rapidly running out to find a solution. At the end of this month, the UK will be hosting COP26, a conference that is seen by many as the best, if not the last chance we have. Around 200 world leaders are expected for this summit, seen as the most crucial ever held. Despite the pandemic and lockdowns, global carbon emissions have continued to rise, along with global temperatures, with the last five years being the hottest on record. According to the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it is unequivocal and indisputable that humans are warming the planet. Six years ago, almost every nation signed up to the 2015 Paris Climate Accord, an agreement that aimed to keep the rise in global temperatures well below two degrees Celsius this century and to pursue efforts to keep it under one and a half degrees. Now, scientists say both targets will be broken unless we all take drastic action to cut carbon emissions. Small islands like Jersey are at a greater risk of rising sea levels, volatile weather and receding coastlines than larger, higher emitting countries. But even we have a part to play, and not least because we continue to burn large volumes of fossil fuels. Although Jersey has made progress, there is so much more to do. Over the last 30 years, Jersey's overall carbon emissions have reduced by almost 40% despite a 60% increase in the consumption of electricity. This has substantially been achieved as a result of Jersey Electricity's strategy to build a grid to import low carbon electricity from France instead of generating power on island using oil. These imports are presently sourced from two thirds nuclear and one third certified renewable hydropower. Today, thanks to significant investments in further smart grid infrastructure, Jersey benefits from a virtually completely decarbonised electricity system, something that the UK is unlikely to achieve for many years. Jersey now has access to almost limitless supplies of low carbon, reliable and affordable power, available on tap when we need it. We've also made progress with other carbon reduction projects. We've created products to encourage customers to switch from fossil fuels to electricity and have doubled this rate of conversion. We're now developing new solutions to make it even easier for others to change from fossil fuel to heating and transport, the two key areas of mission for Jersey. We've recently built an island-wide smart meter network, 50,000 meters continuously gathering data to help improve network efficiency and give our customers more visibility over energy efficiency and consumption via our MyJE Smart App. We've encouraged the uptake of electric transport by investing in 95 public chargers, providing Jersey with a higher density of chargers per capita than any other town or city in the UK. And although they won't help further decarbonise electricity in Jersey, we're also introducing more local on-island renewables onto the grid. Working with key partners, we've built the two largest roof-based solar schemes in the Channel Islands. By February this year, we were generating just under a million units of local solar power from our four community-scale arrays. And we have around 30 more partnership investments in the pipeline. We also continue to explore offshore wind and tidal power, assessing how and when we might transform and diversify our energy mix. Like those global leaders represented at COP26, the Government of Jersey will develop its own goals and climate policies. And we hope that the island will be bold and ambitious. Delivering net zero will be a challenge for every country, but Jersey has real advantages. We have no heavy industry here, short travelling distances, a decarbonised electricity grid with spare capacity, and an island-wide fibre network that boasts the fastest internet speeds in the world to enable rapid deployment of technology in an ever more sustainable way. Jersey's Citizens' Assembly on climate change earlier this year showed that there is clear appetite for zero carbon. There will for sure be difficult decisions ahead and we know we don't have all the answers, but we're convinced that Jersey could deliver net zero faster and more cost effectively than virtually anywhere else. We encourage everyone in Jersey, individuals, families and businesses and all our friends and partners off the island to get involved, 
share ideas and help each other create and deliver viable low carbon solutions. We believe this is a real opportunity for Jersey, an opportunity to build on the island's strengths and to lead. But it's also an obligation to this beautiful island and our children and our children's children. The time for action is now and we must join forces and take it. And now I'm pleased to introduce Jersey's Environment Minister, John Young. Welcome. I'd like to extend my welcome to all the delegations on the call today, and I'm delighted to support Senator Gorst and welcome you to this inter-island pre-COP webinar at this pivotal point in our history. And I'm really excited for this opportunity for us to consider the most important issue of our time and share knowledge and ideas for both mitigation and adaption solutions across our island homes. And I'd like to start by briefly setting the scene for the discussion today by outlining a little about Jersey's carbon neutral on our net zero journey. Prior to 2019, we had a carbon reduction strategy in line with Kyoto, Kyoto commitments a plan to reduce emissions by 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. But the science is now telling us that this is simply not ambitious enough. And in response to increasing global ambition led by the science, Jersey's Parliament declared a climate emergency in 2019. And this led to the publication of our carbon neutral strategy six months later. But the strategy didn't provide all the answers. Instead, it put in a people power process at the heart of the development of the decarbonisation plan. And so we convened a citizens' assembly, supported by an island wide community conversation that we could build our decarbonisation plan, starting with Ireland's own aspirations and commitments. And our citizens' assembly of climate change was made up of 45 randomly selected islands. Islanders represent a cross section of our community and I held 15 virtual meetings between March and May this year, which comprised over 1,500 hours of deliberation time, supported by experts and stakeholders who gave evidence to the Assembly and engaged in lively discussions with our participants. And the convening question was, how should we work together to become carbon neutral? And the participants made a series of detailed and thorough recommendations focusing on the key emission sectors for Jersey, space heating and transport. And all of their many recommendations were underpinned by a very strong message that Jersey should be ambitious in reducing emissions and that we would all benefit from the approved quality of local life that this would bring. More still, they recognised that not acting would have a much bigger and long-lasting impact on the lives of future generations. Thus, the expectation has been set for our government to respond with its detailed policies. And we will come forward for consultation in December with our Carbon Neutral Roadmap. Here, we will detail the action plans and emission reduction trajectory to achieve net zero targets in line with the Paris Agreement which we are seeking be extended to Jersey. In addition, we are also actively considering how we might make progress ahead of Paris targets, aiming for carbon neutrality by 2030. And there is a strong recognition that we must commit to a just transition and take every part of our society along with us. And we're hearing firsthand the likely impacts of policies on the most vulnerable, such as low-income households, the disabled, and those working in carbon-heavy industry. And this is vital to the design of our carbon-neutral roadmap. And perhaps we will have the opportunity here today to discuss how we might all learn from one another. Now, as islands, we all have risks, barriers, and opportunities in common when it comes to climate change. A positive that I understand may not be the same for others is a long-standing relationship with low carbon electricity suppliers, as you have just heard from Jersey Electricity. 
where I'm sure we will have similarities in our vulnerability to sea level rise and with a limited land mass. Our on-island sequestration opportunities are much less than larger countries. Turning to adaptation, Jersey has a long history of protecting our land and indeed even, even claiming land from the sea and the island's capital is St Helier. And in 2020, we visited our approach to coastal defences in a large climate change adaptation project. We called it the Shoreline Management Plan. And this modelled the impacts of sea level rise on coastal flooding around the highland using the latest prediction on future sea levels and extreme weather and flooding events. And that was developed in consultation with our community. And we have a plan to ensure that our coastal, coastal defences continue to protect the island over the next 100 years. And it allows us to make prioritised funding allocations for projects. Importantly, it also means that islanders know that we're committed to protecting their homes and businesses. Whilst I know others may face harder choices with regard to sea level choice and extreme weather, we strive to share best practice, our experiences and learnings with others. We all understand how the natural world can play an essential role in both our mitigation and adaption strategies for climate change. Tackling the climate emergency by using nature-based solutions that also address the biodiversity crisis provides benefits on multiple fronts. And the small size of Jersey, only 116 square kilometres of land, and our dense population, 107,000, means that our natural spaces and the opportunity they provide for terrestrial carbon sinks are limited. Nevertheless, our wonderful biodiversity and wide range of natural habitats have intrinsic value for so many other reasons, including natural climate resilience, for example, acting to reduce the impact of torrential rain through improved drainage, providing shading for buildings from extreme heat, and providing natural rock armoring that protects our infrastructure from storms. Wildlife value. We actively manage our natural sites to conserve biodiversity. And what a major project for this year has been developing a tree strategy, which will help to improve our ability to protect and manage trees in our countryside and urban areas, focusing on what's important for the people of Jersey. And then visual, geological and cultural value. Our unique landscape of a small wooded valleys transecting the sloping rocky, rocky plateau of Jersey, the wild exposed coastal heaths to the northwest and southwest, dunes leading to our five mile sandy storm beach facing the Atlantic Ocean to the west, and our majestic granite cliffs of our north coast. These are at the heart of our special environment that underpins Jersey Islanders' life and brings them health and well being. And due to our small landmass, our terrestrial sequestration opportunities are limited. And living on islands surrounded by sea, we have a huge intertidal area of natural resource all around us, potentially offering enormous blue carbon sinks within our marine environment. And we've just completed a desktop evaluation of our blue carbon resource in partnership with the universities of Plymouth and Exeter and the Blue Marine Foundation. And the amount of carbon already sequestered annually around Jersey's seas is estimated at around 60,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide, which is around the same as the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions for the entire Jersey business sector. So we're very, very keen to work with international colleagues on how marine sequestration can be protected, increased, and appropriately accounted for in carbon budgets. Handing Handing over, I hope now that that has given you a brief insight into our vision and how we will progress towards net zero. Before I pass over to our discussion with our moderator for today, Dr. Louise Magri, I would like to thank you once again for joining us today. We are all excited to hear about your island's work, projects and policies, and ensure knowledge about how we can work together across our jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you, Ministers. Um, as the Minister for Environment said, I'm Dr. Louise Magris, and I work for the government in the sustainability and foresight space. And I'm delighted to have the task today to keep us all to time 
I know that there's going to be more to say than there is time available, so I hope you'll be patient with me as I try and keep us to some sort of order. Um, and I'm sure, you, I'm sure you'll play along with me in that. Um, you've all been super patient while we've, Jersey's held the floor, and uh, now the opportunity is to hand over to the representatives from the different jurisdictions that are with us today. We're looking forward to hearing your expertise and experiences around climate change, which will set the scene for the wider discussions that we'll go on to have in the second half of the webinar. So to begin with, I'd like to invite in from Ant oh, representing Antigua and Barbuda, Her Excellency Karen Mayhill, who's High Commissioner for Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you, Dr. Magri and uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, small states, we know, face acute impacts of climate change in a disproportionate way, notwithstanding the fact that we are the least contributors to climate change. Antigua and Barbuda is a member of the Alliance of Small States, and in fact, we are the current chair of the 44-member strong EOSIS. It has been shown that collectively, the members of EOSIS emit just 1.5% of emissions of industrialized nations. And yet many of us have already begun to roll out ambitious programs to reduce our small carbon footprint, footprint, particularly renewable energy. In just this year, our government updated its national determined contribution, signaling our government's policy direction for responding to climate change. This update also reaffirmed our government's commitment to act as the catalyst for the private sector and enable them to play an active part in the transition by the NDCs. We recognize that these commitments cannot be achieved without the active um, involvement and investment and buy-in of the local private sector. I want to share a few examples of some of our targets, which are, which are ambitious, but deliberately so, as we seek to move the climate change uh, discussion forward as a small state in the Caribbean. But look quickly at um, adaptation. We have revised our building code, uh, requiring all new homes to have backup renewable energy generation and storage systems by 2025. We have decided that 100% of our water supply infrastructure must be powered by their own grid interactive renewable energy sources by 2030. If I look at nat nature, our nature targets, we have decided that all remaining wetlands, watershed areas, and seagrass bed areas with carbon sequestration potential be protected as carbon sinks by 2030. And as far as debt for climate swaps are concerned, we hope to initiate with willing creditors uh, these uh, types of uh, our financial arrangements. On our finance targets of the NDCs, we've put in place a legal and technical framework to align finance flows with a low greenhouse gas emission and the climate resilient development pathway. And we're committed to raising 120 million US dollars in finance from external support providers for adaptation in the private sector by 2030. But just give a flavor of what we've decided on the energy targets. We have decided to commit to 86% renewable energy generation from local resources in the electricity sector by 2030, as well as to have 100% of all new vehicle sales to be electric vehicles, again, by 2030. But of course, we know that all small states are not the same. And certainly, we are a small island developing state um, in, in, in the Caribbean. And to achieve these NBCs, we recognize that there are unique challenges that we face. So for example, as much as climate finance is being made available to developing countries through a number of international initiatives, most of our countries have limited capacity to access these finances. We are concerned at the high landed costs of needed technology for SIDS to implement mitigation and adaptation actions. We are also aware of increasing number of stranded assets, obsolete technology owned by SIDS, that are deemed high mission technologies and or maladaptive. And we're also, in many instances, dumping grounds for old and soon to be obsolete technologies by larger countries onto SIDS that are moving ahead with their transition. This is a reality for our countries, just locking us into a development pathway that potentially maintains the inequity of rich and poorer countries. So some solutions that we have come up with with respect to how we achieve these NBCs. We believe in partnership, in working as part of a group, and we see that in bodies like AOSIS, even in participating in this forum today, that we, we, we are participating in a platform for joint advocacy around the challenges that small states are face. I, I mentioned as, as a second solution, the Commonwealth Climate Finance Access Hub, which many of our small states in the Commonwealth find extremely useful 
This hub helps countries to unlock the available climate finance. And through this initiative, small and vulnerable member states are assisted to bid for and gain increased access to climate finance. It is urgent that policymakers of the international financial institutions instruct that more determining criteria of small size resource constraints and vulnerabilities be taken into account for sectional financing. Antigua, for example, is totally a middle income country. And as a result, we are barred from much of the concessional financing and ODA that could support our move towards realizing these NDCs. And we are asking for vulnerability to be considered more within the um, definition of, uh, of, of a country's development path. We have prepared a national adaptation plan that will be completed, where we are preparing a national adaptation plan which will be completed by 2022 to be submitted to UNFCCC. Uh, this plan is a hybrid approach, incorporating the sector-focused adaptation planning with broad national assessments to form a, a comprehensive strategic plan for national adaptation planning. And our priority areas in our national adaptation plan are finance, protected managed areas, infrastructure and housing, tourism and food security. And uh, I think that that gives an overview of Antigua and Barbuda's ambitions as far as NDCs are concerned and the sort of commitments that we're making ahead of uh, COP26. Uh, Madam Moderator, I turn back over to you. Thank you very much and some exciting targets for you there. I was interested particularly in the 100% of electric vehicles by 2030. That's fantastic news. So now, uh, heading over to uh, representatives from Bahrain, I'd love to welcome Ms. Leila Sabil, who's Senior Environmentalist Specialist of Bahrain's Supreme Council for the Environment. Um, thank you for the invitation for today's conference. I would like um, to um, welcome you all um, in this conference. It's a good opportunity for us in Bahrain to be part of the SIDS and to share experience of what we have done and wh what we are intended to do. Um, <clears throat> I think we, um, it's, ve it's, very it's, it's very interesting how to see how, how much we can see the common um, challenges and the common um, um, uh, potential for the six countries. Um, in Bahrain, we are suffering from um, extreme extreme uh, temperature. Uh, we have witnessed sea level rise, um, and thus our um, our work was more more focusing on the adaptation. As we have been working on our national adaptation investment plan, uh, and we, what we uh, what, and, and this is why we have chosen investment plan rather than, than just a national adaptation investment plan, is because the adaptation projects are still um, inattractive and the business case is not as strong as the mitigation projects. And this is what we faced with with financing different um, uh, adaptation projects. And so we identified the, our vulnerability assessment by identifying four sectors that will be very impacted by, um, by uh, the climate change, uh, biodiversity, water, urban planning, and um, agriculture. And we identified 47 projects that can help and help in, and contribute into increasing Bahrain's resilience to climate change. Uh, and we did what, what we did is that we, um, uh, uh, with, with the sharing of the uh, uh, perspective from other governmental entities, we worked on a shortlist criteria to shortlist these projects into 15 projects that can contribute to um, Bahrain's resilience and can um, can uh, benefit uh, in reducing uh, reducing the climate change impact. And we are working now on. Um, and we are working now on the adaptation finance finance adaptation financing strategy, adaptation financing strategy, adapt, financing adapt, uh, financing adaptation strategy to identify the financing um, windows uh, that can um, fund these projects. We are. Um, uh, anticipating into um, expanding this national adaptation and investment plan to cover lots of projects, but it's, it's a, lear a learning process and it's learning progress. As we uh, worked on the national adaptation investment plan, we realized that, oh, then the sustainable finance framework should be developed as well to, 
to be comprehensive, not to just cover the adaptation, but also different type of projects. And this is how we started working with the adaptation, sustainable finance framework in cooperation with the private sector and CB central bank, as well as Ministry of Finance and International Economy. Because we looked at the document as a co, or co uh, uh, as an, a national document that should be co-created with different different um, uh, stakeholders to allow them to have um, co-ownership of the document and to mobilize financing and funds for um, different projects. Um, we also um, worked on the vulnerability on our coastal areas when we um, witnessed the sea level rise and we did assess assessment for the whole um, coastal area um, in Bahrain where we identified the infrastructure that we be impacted by the sea level rise. And we are working now on a, an, on a timeline uh, on an action plan that has um, assessed um, the, the magnitude of the risk, the priority in making an action, and the, um, the type of action that need to be taken in order to increase our, the resilience of our sea level rise and our, uh, the resilience of our uh, coastal areas and um, infrastructure. Uh, I also would like to add that when we look at mitigation as well, we did um, our shares of uh, renewable targets, Y2035, and we also have the energy efficiency plan. Uh, we also look at the uh, national afforestation uh, plan, what where we identify the the type of the trees that can and can contribute into reducing um, emission as part of um, adaptation with co benefit, and then we did a thermal maps for all of Bahrain to identify the key hotspots uh, as priority area to. Um, increase the landscape and afforestation in that area in order to um, reduce the, the elevated temperature and um, improve the health and well-being. Um, uh, um, we are looking forward to hear uh, about um, the contribution of other 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 um, since country and thank you for the opportunity and allowing me to uh, share Bahrain's experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's fascinating to hear about the real balance of adaptation and mitigation that you're facing there at the very extreme end of some of the impacts of climate change. Um, I think now if we can go to the Isle of Man, I'd like to welcome in member of the House of Keys, Daphne Kane, who's climate change minister and chair of the Isle of Man Climate Change Transformation Board. Um, and also on the call is Mr. Richard Lowell, who's the Isle of Man Climate Change Transformation Director and Chief Exec of uh, the Department for Environment and Agriculture. Hi there. Good afternoon and thank you for inviting us to take part in this webinar today. Um, if I just explain, I'm Daphne Kane. I have recently been re-elected to serve a second term in the House of Keys and uh, environment has very much been one of my priorities over the previous term. And in this house, I'm honoured that uh, actually less than a week ago, I was appointed chair of the Climate Change Transformation Board. So I'm very grateful for the uh, support team here who've an awful lot more knowledge in the area than I have. Um, but if I could just give you a little overview about the Isle of Man and recently what we have achieved. Um, the Isle of Man recognises the climate emergency and understands that we need to act together to overcome one of the greatest challenges that humanity has faced. As an island, we are wholly committed to achieving net zero by 2050. This is underpinned by the development of our climate change bill, which we hope will shortly receive royal assent and means our net zero targets will become enshrined in law. We are keen to play our role in mitigating climate change as part of the wider global commitment to keep temperature increases to 1.5 degrees. And we have been working with the other UK Crown dependencies to seek an extension of the Paris Agreement to the Isle of Man. As an island nation, we know, like you all, that we are especially vulnerable to some of the climate change adaptation strategies um, challenges, the, the climate change adaptation challenges, including increased sea level rise, increased strength and frequency of storms, flooding and coastal erosion. Some of the adaptation measures outlined for the next few years are estimated to cost hundreds of millions of pounds. As 
well as the 60 actions agreed by our parliament in our phase one action plan to reduce emissions, we have just consulted on our first statutory climate change plan for 2022 to 27, which sets an immediate pathway and aggressive set of actions to meet our net zero goal. This includes the setting of an ambitious interim target, which we are currently analysing and developing a roadmap for. Our other priorities include the decarbonation of our energy supply, and time has been spent analysing the best way for the island to achieve this, whilst aligning ourselves to the energy trilemma of low cost, sustainable supply and resilience decarbonizing homes by moving away from coal, oil, and natural gas as a heat source, ensuring a just transition so that no one is disadvantaged. Which one's gone? The, the, this, is, this, is, this has failed. I've got the loop. The loop. So do you now carry on on that one? Hello? So how do I? Oh, if you, hello, can you hear me? We can, you're with us loud just, and clear. Oh, hi there. <laughs> just had on. to well switch. <laughs> my um, my battery's just cracked, uh, gone flat. So I'll just uh, come into you from here. So just, just going through our priorities. Um, can you hear me? I think it's on mute, isn't it? No, um, we can hear you loud and clear. Mute, yeah. If you can all hear me, and I'll just go into the uh, other priorities, um, including, I think we just got to decarbonisation of homes mm -hmm. by moving away from coal, oil and natural gas as a heat source, ensuring a just transition so that no one is disadvantaged on our journey to net zero, and making sure that we build on the co-benefits of climate action to build a better future for everyone in our community. Moving away from a reliance on fossil fuel based transport to communities that are designed to reduce the need to travel, active travel, public transport. And I don't know if they can hear me. We can hear yes, you. Can. Please do can. carry on. OK, so um, moving away from I've just lost my place. Active, travel. active travel, public transport and low carbon alternatives such as electrification. Implementing a full public awareness campaign for people to understand how we will achieve net zero as a nation, as well as how they can play a part individually. And finally, developing a land management plan to ensure that increasing our natural carbon capture is carried out in a manner that maximizes carbon sequestration and wider ecosystem benefits and doesn't have unintended consequences that we will regret in future. We are especially proud of our UNESCO biosphere status, which recognizes our entire island as the first entire island nation biosphere reserve in the world. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Isle of Man, our beautiful island includes a varied coastline of cliffs, stacks, central hills, islets, and long beaches. The hills hold important peat reserves and are deeply cut by wooded glens in the east. The coastal plain in the north contains pockets of unimproved grassland, pools, and wetlands. Our biosphere reserve extends out into the Irish Sea and encompasses all of the Isle of Man's territorial waters. The seabed contains a rich and varied biodiversity including horse mussel reefs, merle beds, kelp forests and seagrass meadows, many of which are protected within our network of 10 marine nature reserves. Our climate change commitments, which we outlined in January 2020, follow an intensive scoping exercise led by an independent advisor, Professor James Curran, combined with a highly supportive government means that the island will lead on innovative nature-based solutions, including enhancing blue carbon and using our marine nature reserve network for climate, mit climate change mitigation and adaptation, and accelerate tree planting, peatland restoration, and other habitat restoration projects. Accordingly, we have recently started work on a marine carbon strategy 
to maximise blue carbon. A blue carbon audit will soon be underway, building on an initial audit carried out in 2018. And we believe that our surrounding seas are one of our greatest strengths in terms of potential for climate change mitigation. This is an area where we believe the island could become a global leader in innovative marine management. For example, kelp can play a role as a carbon sink, but it could also play a part in our energy transition as a biofuel. Research undertaken around the world has suggested that other species of seaweed lower methane emissions in cows by as much as 80%. We've made great progress over the past couple of years, but we are under no illusion of the magnitude of the task that we have in ahead of us to deliver on our commitments. In particular, we recognize the importance of working with others and learning from colleagues, and this forum is of particular value. Thank you. Thank you so much, and congratulations on your recent appointment to this exciting area. Um, I'm sure our hearts went out to every one of you when, you when your link went then, but don't worry, we heard everything that you had to tell us, and it was fascinating, particularly the stuff around the energy trilemma, something that's playing out uh, uh, strongly in the markets in, uh, in Europe at the moment, and I think those of us at this end of the world are feeling that very strongly. Um, so moving on now to Madeira, I'd like to welcome in Mr. Pedro Salt. Sal Poldera, um, who's Head of Climate Action and the Sustainability Unit at the Regional Secretariat for the Environment and Climate Change in the Regional Government of Madeira. Thank you very much. I uh, would first like to, um, to welcome all our uh, other jurisdictions and to thank the kind invitation from the Jersey Government uh, to participate in this event. Uh, Madeira and Jersey have a long and very close historic connections, as many Madeirans for decades uh, have moved and are still today moving abroad to live in Jersey, where they have always been warmly received and fully integrated in the community, contributing for its social and economic development. But for us, this event is an opportunity to further develop this historic relationship, promoting cooperation between our islands uh, towards facing the, these uh, huge common challenges. So climate change alongside biodiversity loss or unsustainable exploitation of natural resources are the main environmental challenges that humanity is now facing. Never in the course of history, the growth and development models were so centered in the environment and climate action. The need to prevent the consequences of climate change and to take firm environmental actions is growing every day, demanding an urgent reorientation of the investment flows. Priorities are set to protect the planet while promoting sustainable territories, continuously improving population lifestyle quality with sustainable buildings, ecological mobility, and scientific, technological, and economic development. So this demands an individual and collective mindset shift. The, sh the challenge is even bigger when speaking about islands. Madeira Island, although being a small and outermost territory, and this is uh, really important because it doubles the challenge. As taking this challenge very seriously, setting very ambitious targets regarding climate action. The first one is to reduce 55% of greenhouse gases emissions until 2030 and to pursue carbon neutrality until 2050. To reach these targets and to measure the progress towards it, several strategic documents and instruments have been or are being developed. Just to name a few, we have a sustainable energy and climate action plan in development. We have set an adaptation strategy in 2015, which we are about to, um, uh, to review, given the, the new science uh, available. We have also set the circular economy agenda and the waste management strategy. And of course, the GHG emission inventory. Since 2015, Madeira has also joined the Under Two Coalition, a global community of state and regional governments committed to ambitious climate action in line with the Paris Agreement. This coalition that brings together 20, 260 governments representing 1.75 billion people and nearly 50% of the global economy have been taking coordinated action to act as climate leaders, pursuing an emission reduction trajectory consistent with the Paris Agreement objectives and in line with the most recent science. So the priorities are clear. Let's speak about strengths. 
the main strengths are focus, compromise, and strategic planning. The 2021 regional budget has allocated 40% of its total, nearly 300 million euros towards environment and climate change in areas as diverse as sustainable mobility, adaptation, risk management and prevention, special planning, energy, circular economy, or waste management. The recently approved Regional Recovery and Resilience Plan, a European Union instrument set for economic recovery after COVID, has reserved nearly 150 million euros, 25% of the total budget, for investments toward climate action, resilience improvement, and to speed up climate and digital transition. This combination of strategic planning and financial resources allocation to implement specific yet concrete measures has allowed some achievements in key indicators. Until 2018, we have reduced in 20, 26% our emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, Yet, we are on the verge of reaching 50% renewable energy penetration in, in the total energy mix production. 65% of our terrestrial area and 75% of terrestrial waters are already designated under Natura 2000 networks, biosphere reserve, or other nature protected regimes. And our, our air quality is evaluated as excellent. So we'll continue the investment in nature conservation, reforestation, coastal protections, water management, renewable energy production, waste, man waste management or education, just to give a few examples. While preserving cultural heritage, authenticity of the territory, keeping it attractive to tourism, our main economic activity is not an easy task. However, islanders have always been faced with enormous challenges since the beginning of settlement. The first one was to get here, then to tame nature, to feed and survive, to thrive and allow economic development and prosperity for the people. Madeira has always done this while preserving its most valuable resource, which is nature, and always developing, developing the art of well-receiving, constructing friendship bonds with whoever visited us. This event can be an opportunity for exchanging experiences and be best practices, setting a communication platform uh, among our territories with their unique characteristics, but certainly with common challenges towards what we need the most, action. Climate, change, climate challenges are huge, but islands and islanders will once again be an example of resilience, cooperation, and I'm certain success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting and challenging issues that you're facing there too. Um, talking of challenging issues, I'm afraid our technical line with Guernsey's momentarily gone down. So we're going to wait for them to be able to dial in. So the opportunity now, I think, is to go into an area of open discussion that we've suggested, um, which I think will be really fruitful for all of us. Uh, we're particularly interested, I think, in the first instance, in thinking about nature and the impact of climate change both on our natural environment, but also how na nature solutions can help us mitigate and become resilient to the impacts of climate change. I think perhaps it's a good idea to, to pose the question to begin with, but then I'd love to draw in members from around the table. Um, perhaps what we could do is consider how global ch climate change has already had observable effects on the natural world that we're all very familiar with and some of you have picked up already in your, in your uh, pieces. Um, I think what we'd like to know is how your jurisdictions are working to uh, reduce the impacts of climate change on the natural environment and perhaps how also as a solution to climate change. I know particularly the, the Isle of Man has some interest in this space as well as Madeira. So perhaps I could ask the Isle of Man to go first if that would uh, suit you. Which is it on? Hi, Just going. Oh, Isle of Man is coming in with us. Mike, do you want to go to Madeira first? I'm just getting the notes in order and the 
it just put a charger on the video so it might build up a bit no no problem at all no problem at all we understand the real life impacts of trying to do this stuff on a webinar uh madeira pedro we'd love to hear from you and your experiences in madeira yeah thanks um so what I can tell you is, um, of course, that we are observing the effects uh, of climate change already. Uh, the main, the main issue here might be the, the forest fires, uh, and and um, what I can tell you is that we have been working towards nature conservation and protection since the since we became an autonomous region uh, back from 1970s. So, as I told you, we have two thirds of our island uh, protected as a nature reserve, and uh, and we have um, our religious forest, the laurel forest, uh, which is home of a unique biodiversity uh, and is one of the one of the most well preserved uh, forests. Um, we have a strategic plan of early detection and and improving fighting capacity towards forest fires uh, and, and also um, uh, a strategy of fighting alien invasive species uh, to protect uh, our forest. We also have um, strategic spatial planning for fast floods as we have a very diverse territory uh, that um, we, you can be from the mountains to the sea uh, in just a few minutes so fast floating is a uh, is an issue, and uh, and we have also tried to improve our coastal defense, which uh, nowadays is already costing uh, a lot each year. So, as an as an example, we are now developing the first EU funded uh, climate life project, uh, a 3.5 million euro project to improve the coastal defense through the recovery of the dune cord on our second main island, the island of Port Saint. Um, so. As we have a very diverse territory, uh, this sets a, a lot of challenges because we need to to protect the forest, we need to protect, protect people, and we need to improve coastal defense and to improve the special planning of our territory. So it, it's a huge challenge. We have uh, several different uh, activities and um, projects that can that can be uh, replicated elsewhere. And we are also very interested in knowing how other territories with similar issues are, are dealing with this. Thank you very much. It is really sobering, isn't it, to think of the impact of forest fires on you know, people's immediate livelihoods and lives, in fact. Very frightening stuff. Um, would Isle of Man like to come in now? Yeah, we're ready. Thank you very much for that. And just I really, really appreciate hearing other people's experience and uh, action being taken. Um, but I suppose in terms of the natural world, um, the Isle of Man has taken great strides to um, start with a, a people's forest. The chief minister, previous chief minister, launched um, a huge planting. So we're going to be planting a tree for every resident. So that's around 85,000 trees um, in a in a area down in the south of the island um, they've also um, refreshed the grant schemes that are available including a woodland grant scheme for people um, having areas on their own property to um, plant for, for forests and woodland um, and also for landowners an agri environment scheme especially for the uplands um, and then we come to blue carbon and the marine zones and in the Isle of Man biodiversity strategy there are various actions around monitoring the impact of climate change on the natural environment um, and we have that collaboration with scientists in the UK on a long-term monitoring program for the, con the uh, climate impact on our shore life there's commitment to identify species and habitats most likely to be or already affected by climate change and start implementing appropriate adaptation measures. And we have a clear action that by 2025, our government will monitor, understand and substantially reduce the other main pressures on biodiversity in particularly environmental pollution, the prevalence of invasive non-native species, and we're taking measures to meet the biodiversity challenges posed by climate change. So, so one of those is the horse mussel reefs um, off the island, particularly in the Ramsey Marine Reserve and off Douglas around the Marine Drive. Um, that's already been identified as a, as a 
and at risk area. Thank you very much. Challenging things there for us to think about and uh, reflect on in our own jurisdictions. I think we've got just one more moment to discuss uh, nature solutions. Um, and perhaps something that's really relevant in terms of the island context is the fact that we're all limited in space to one degree or another. And of course, that limits what we're able to achieve when we're trying to balance up the climate uh, crisis as, as well as the biodiversity crisis. I don't know if anybody would like to comment on that particularly. I, I wonder perhaps if Bahrain would like to come in on that particular point. Um, the limited um, area is something uh, that we really uh, faced because um, uh, we are uh, highly ur urbanized. Uh, we have limited space and the population is around 1.7 million uh, people um, putting pressure on um, uh, expansion. And it's very difficult to, um, to find this balance between um, the projects that, uh, project that re requires investments that, that would create jobs and the housing and the housing requ required for the population, among other issues like um, nature, in, in nature, expanding nature or expanding agriculture or expanding um, uh, the afforestation. And that's why we are working on two, two projects, is uh, two separate projects. One is um, increased afforestation in urban areas and the other thing and uh, the other project is uh, increase the, the uh, green belt um, uh, around desert area we also uh, are looking at mangroves because in Bahrain we have 80 hectares of um, mangroves so it's um, a very, it was very essential for us to conserve what we have and, and expand it more because it will increase the resilience of our coastal areas as well as blue carbon credits such as seagrass projects and we have a, a very very interesting um, uh, ecosystem for oyster beds and pearl, pearl, pearls. So most of the pearl um, paths in Bahrain are considered to be um, a reserved area. And we are expanding um, the um, oyster beds uh, rehabilitation schemes um, in order to generate more um, of um, blue carbon credits in the, in the sea rather than um, in, the, in, the, in the main island. Thank you so much. The emerging theme, isn't it, is about how we can all use our marine spaces. Naturally, as islands, those tend to be a lot bigger than our terrestrial spaces. And there's a real opportunity for us all there to share knowledge on how that might be achieved. I wonder perhaps if Antigua and Barbuda would like to come in on this point at all. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, you know, in, in, in Antigua, we, we also have a very limited land space. You know, and we, we, are, we are three main islands. Um, and uh, the total um, square mileage of those islands is about 660 kilometers squared, although our ocean territory is 110,000 kilometers squared, so we, we are definitely uh, an ocean state. But what, what we have done is to um, identify um, zones of, of, of areas that are marine protected spaces, which make it um, 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 difficult and impossible for developers to remove mangrove or to um, um, engage in those, those spaces without, without um, much agitation. And, uh, and, and we also seek to ensure that with each project that we develop on the islands, that they are, there's an in, uh, environmental impact assessment done um, that will guide developers and the government in the decision making around, around these things. So finding that balance between the environment and the need for development when you're a tourist-based um, small island development state is critical. But also we've discovered that many tourists are increasingly very uh, nature, nature um, conscientious. And so if we, are, if we want to sustain our, our tourism model at the level that we want to do so, we also recognize we need to find a way to ensure that tourists are satisfied that when they come to Antigua Barbuda, it's, it's a place where the environment um, is, 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 is protected. I'll just share really quickly that um, a, a, an interesting story from Antigua. We have a little island called Redonda off the coast of Antigua. And it was an island that was um, infested with rats and, and, and some goats for a very long time. And it made it impossible for um, the natural flora and fauna of that island to develop. And uh, with you, you, you and up a few years ago, we were able to remove all the goats and, and the thousands of rats. And that island has now become an oasis of a pristine, untouched, um, and natural natural space. And we've placed that island and the waters around it into a protected area as well, so that the world can enjoy it and, and science can be um, allowed to thrive there. So I, I think that's how we have tried to balance the need for development um, with, with, with responsibility to protect um, and enhance the environment. 
Thank you very much. That's fascinating, the type of uh, really concentrated conservation effort that you've undertaken there and how important that is for those of us with very small uh, spaces, but yet still wanting to, to tackle the biodiversity crisis as best we possibly can. I think now, sadly, I know we could talk for a lot longer about nature-based solutions, but I think the, the time means that we need to move on to the adaptation part of the discussion. Um, I'm sorry, we still haven't quite got Guernsey back in the room, um, so we'll go on and hope that they join us before the end of the call. I know they're trying very hard to be with us. But perhaps what we can think about now in terms of adaptation, and this is something um, that came up in the, in the discussions around the table, was um, extreme weather. So for some of us, that's flooding. For some, it's, it's heat. For some, it's fires. Um, and I think there's probably some really interesting uh, discussion points that we might be able to pick up in terms of uh, tackling civic and public future planning um, with regards to public health preparation for climate change. I'm thinking particularly heat as an example. And I wonder if Bahrain would like to come in there for, for, to talk about heat, as I know that you, you picked that up in, in your opener. Um, yes, um, it, every year um, uh, since uh, 1902, we are um, exceeding the, the temperature levels. Um, every year we, record, we break the record, records in temperature. And this is um, something that it was, um, it, it's, it caused um, um, very, um, it, it is urgent because it impacts the health and the well-being of the people. Um, it poses uh, lots of restriction on um, the, the daily life of the people. And that's why we came up with um, a national afforestation plan. What we did is that we identified the type of the trees that are suitable for Bahrain. And then we did a thermal maps for the past few years to identify the hot pockets, to identify the priority areas that we want to increase plantation in them. Um, we noticed that there is um, heat activities that cause elevated temperature in some um, uh, the, 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 in some areas because of the waste heat generated from air conditioning. And we, we uh, started this pilot project to plant uh, trees in these areas. And then we will take another round of satellite image to see how the temperature is, re is being reduce reduced. Uh, we have um, revised our building code to ensure that it's energy efficient. Uh, we also we are also looking at district cooling as a project in, in order to have more centralized air conditioning uh, for uh, buildings instead of having uh, different um, uh, different uh, air conditioning units for every uh, uh, huge building and expanding the heat uh, wasted from these air conditioning um, uh, uh, buildings. Uh, we also think of um, the electrical vehicles targets will help us to contribute um, in, uh, in um, eliminating the emissions generated from the mobile sources. And this might contribute also into uh, reducing the temperature. Uh, we also we are also looking at the water sensitive designs in building and, uh, and, and urban areas to make sure that it can be reduced by what by artificial water bodies but it is uh, still under assessment and we are testing different um, different uh, technologies different methods in order to reduce temperature we also included health and the adaptation plan to make sure that uh, heat strokes and heat-related diseases are being tackled by the public health uh, in Bahrain uh, to make sure that um, we reduce fertility and morbidity uh, if, it may, if the heat may, may cause any. Thank you so much. It's, it's very sobering again to think of the impact of heat in terms of you know, human morbidity. Um, it, it, in more cooler climates like our own, we're used to it being quite uncomfortable. Um, but we too are feeling the, the um, impacts of, of hotter nights in particular, nothing like you, are, of course, are, but the recognition that that needs to be accounted for in, in planning policies particularly. So thank you very much from that. Uh, I believe Pedro would like to come in from Madeira. Thanks. 
Um, well, Madeira has a temperate climate, so this means that our temperatures don't usually get too extreme, neither in summer nor in winter. And uh, But as heat extremes get more and more usual, uh, public health is, of course, a concern. I believe this is not as severe as in other jurisdictions, of course. Um, uh, so the, the public health is not the major concern uh, here. The major concern is for the issue of forest fires mm -hmm. and water scarce. But uh, even that doesn't prevent us for, for having some investments in green corridors in cities or adapting buildings um, to, to, uh, to those new climate conditions and also to improve our public health system in order to be able to cope with the, with the, the health issues that might be posed by, by those extreme factors uh, that we most likely will see in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting there. Um, in the interest of time, and I know that it's, it's never long enough, is it? I think I'd like to move us on to sustainable finance briefly, because then we will go to the open Q&A session. And we've got questions coming in on Slido, and I know people will be keen to hear those posed and answered. So um, perhaps what we could do as we think about sustainable finance, I think I'd like to open quite broadly on that question by asking, uh, how are islands working to green their finance industry? Um, I think there's plenty to say on that. I know Isle of Man were quite keen to uh, talk a little bit about that, perhaps. Hi, hi there. Thanks for that. I think probably best if I pass over to Richard on this. With the Alamance just got a four hundred million sustainable bond. That that would be fantastic. Thank you. Welcome, Richard. Thank you for that. The uh, the Alamance government recently launched a green bond. And we've got feedback. There we go. Thank you. Uh, which was taken up well by the market uh, and raised four hundred million pound to help fund uh, the climate change initiatives over the next few years. So that covered uh, sustainable transport initiatives, uh, future energy generation work, etc. And, and the crucial part of that was making sure that we complied fully with the sustainable frameworks so that investors had confidence. And I think that uh, goes hand in hand with some of the work that the finance sector are now doing increasingly, both looking at their own ESG more importantly in this context looking at how they can um, get more involved directly in green finance initiatives thank you thank you very much is there anyone else that would like to come in from the call in that space if i could please do come on in yeah just uh, there's a really um, sort of slightly different perspective from um, the caribbean and antigua and, and barbuda in 2017 um, our sister island, Barbuda, was devastated um, by the, the, the biggest, most powerful hurricane we'd ever seen um, before. It, it was uh, extended, um, 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 I think, the size of Texas. It uh, had sustained winds of 175 miles per hour. Our, our scale speaks about a Category 5 hurricane being 150 miles per hour sustained winds. This, this hurricane, Hurricane Irma, had sustained winds of 175 miles per hour and gusts of over 200 miles per hour. It completely flattened um, um, Barbuda. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then a week later, our, sister, um, our, our neighboring island of Dominica um, had um, Hurricane Irma. Uh, which wiped out 220% of their GDP in a matter, in a matter of hours. Um, we have seen um, some climatic occurrences that are more powerful, more aggressive than anything we have seen um, as, as, as a region. And that has made us have to think a lot about how we, one, access finance to rebuild after something that catastrophic. And it has not been a simple um, task for us in, in small island states in the Caribbean to access that, um, that, that, that sort of financing. When, when, when you have 250 million um, dollars wiped out in a, in a few hours. I think m many places in the world would struggle in terms of small mm -hmm. islands to actually raise that sort of finance to, to rebuild and to rebuild better. But we've also sought to not just be victims of it. You know, um, we're not the ones who are causing the, the, the climate, uh, the global temperatures to rise and, and, and our actions are not going to make any impact on it. Uh, what we've tried to do is to, to do things such as our building codes, make them um, more resilient with respect to the building practices that we incorporate. I try to advocate and COP26 will see a united sort of small states agenda around um, emissions and, and, and around access to finance, which goes hand in hand for us. Um, by the way, I'll just say when I was, when I was in 1989, when I was a, a young, much younger, 
my, I experienced my first hurricane, Hurricane Hugo, and I was really excited as a kid to experience that. And I watched that hurricane uh, take the roof completely off my home while I was sleeping in bed because I fell asleep before it came. And that hurricane was a baby compared to what we've, we're experiencing uh, today. Uh, so for, for, for our island states, it's, it's, it's existential. Um, Barbuda you know, literally um, was flattened. And, and uh, had that been the mainland Antigua, I think that, that the death um, toll would have been catastrophic. Um, um, and so, you know, we need to introduce into the conversation every time we speak as a, as a Caribbean, the, the double whammy of, of, of being in the line of these ferocious monster um, um, climatic events and not being able to, to raise the capital to, to, uh, to rebuild and, and to have the resilience that we need. I'll just, I'll just leave that there, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's fascinating to hear the very real impacts and trying to manage your own adaptation and mitigation along with rebuilding in a sustainable way. That's quite the challenge, isn't it? I wonder if that dovetails into a question that perhaps we could open to the floor, which is about how might we as small islands engage in the global and international sustainable finance policy forums? Um, I think that's a space where we've probably all got quite strong for, uh, uh, voices. And I wonder if anyone would like to make some commentary on that. Uh, Antigua, would you like to come in? I'm sorry, could you just um, repeat the last yeah, part? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm uh, sorry. My mic went, yes. Uh, I, was, I was asking, um, during the... Uh, the drawing out the opportunity that we might have as small islands to have strong voices in the global and international sustainable finance policy discussion, how we might make sure that our voices are heard in those forums? Uh, and and, and uh, for us, it, it has to do with um, unity in numbers. It has to be with um, uh, creating joint strategies, agreeing on um, joint positions, whether, whether, whether we're small islands in the Pacific or small islands in the Caribbean and Indian Ocean. Uh, we, we, we all face uh, this, this sort of similar challenges from climate change, especially with respect to the climatic occurrences. And so I think, I think our advocacy needs to be coherent. It needs to be strategic. And, and, and I welcome the sorts of interventions that like the Commonwealth of Nations does for small states or EOSIS does for small states, or in our case, CARICOM does for small states. And, and, and for me, that, that would be key. And I, I, you know, I salute the, the Seychelles, which um, successfully launched the Blue Bond. And, and I was intrigued to hear about the, um, the Green Bond. Um, that mm -hmm. um, I think it was um, Pedro who mentioned that, um, that raised $400 million. Um, um, dollars. You know, and, and I think initiatives like that show that there's appetite out there in the market for this. And I think what we want to do is to work together to ensure that what lessons you learned from that can be used as we structure similar type of instruments, blended finance instruments, to respond to uh, the challenges of both climate change and, and, and adaptation. Thank you very much. I think that's a sobering thought on how we might all, one of the outcomes of today might be an ongoing relationship between us as a real opportunity to to strengthen ourselves through, through numbers and through commonality. That would be really a, a wonderful outcome if that was something that appealed to everybody on the, on the call. I see Pedro has his hand up. Would you like to come in? Yes, thank you. Uh, just to tell you that, uh, that Madeira is part of the European Union uh, is, of course, uh, um, supporting uh, its uh, climate change efforts in EU-funded uh, projects and initiatives, and we are uh, as you know, Europe or the European Union is, uh, is trying to lead the way uh, in, in climate change efforts uh, uh, in the World Forum. So, so we, of course, support that. Uh, regarding the green bonds, the, the European Commission has launched the European Green Deal, um, underlining that there is a need for better direct financial and capital flows to green investments. Uh, this is an ongoing process. It's not, uh, it's not yet finished, but um, uh, but this is something that uh, uh, is about to be uh, finished. And, that, and uh, this is not my area of expertise, but this is, of course, something that, that we think is really important. And just to, 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 to say that, thanks. Thank you. That's, that's a helpful. Um, I believe leila has got her hand up to come into the conversation. Would you like to come on in? Um, yes, um, I would like to second Karen on the importance of having blue bonds as well, because lots of, um, uh, of green financing um, 
uh, green financing um, advertisement was focusing more on the green bonds, whereas small island developing states, we have um, larger uh, wat water bodies than our mainland area. So it makes sense more that the blue bonds have um, more uh, impact on our economy than the green bond. And that's why that we should um, promote this more. Um, I also would like to uh, second Karen and, and another um, uh, element that she had shared, which is a blend, having a blended finance, because of, of, of having a single instrument won't be, um, su won't be sufficient. When it comes to sustainable finance framework and we look at different countries' experience, it doesn't mean that a bigger country have a, um, more advantage. I would say, because um, uh, it depends on the, uh, the type of experience on how this, this sustainable finance framework has been developed. Some countries, the sustainable finance framework came first and then the implementation came later. Others, they started implementing and then they decided, oh, we need a sustainable finance framework. And this two, the two approaches, it doesn't, um, uh, there's nothing right or wrong of it, but it means that all the, 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 all the countries are, 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 are learning how to do this and how to finance projects. Um, I think it's, it's very important for us to um, collaborate together and see how can we um, focus on two types of instruments. One in the adaptation and reducing the impact of uh, climate change, and the other one is for emergency and rebuilding. Um, when it comes to cat catastrophes like the hurricanes that happen to other countries. Um, I think it's also uh, important to um, incorporate the Ministry of Finance and the central banks and look at the opportunities that have been shared by International Monetary Fund. Because when they, they issued their paper about um, the green recovery post-pandemic, they included um, the adaptation projects as, uh, as um, a way for recovering and green stimulating the economy after recession that the COVID-19 has caused. And it's something that we can benefit from. Um, it is very important as well for us to uh, look as well as the a special drawing rights that, that the International Monetary Fund has issued for each country and how can we leverage that and leverage that in financing uh, projects as well. Uh, there's something um, uh, very crucial is to have the private sector involved and and for them it's it's they have different perspective in in analyzing uh, projects than us in the, uh, in the in, as regulators because we look at as of uh, from a um, poor environmental perspective but when we have met with them with regards to our sustainable finance framework they gave us completely different perspective about risk and revenue and it's very important to add the, the flavor of that in, in, in the projects that we are seeking finance with because once we have um, understand the business opportunities of each project, then it will be um, easier to have the buy-in of the private sector and have the buy-in of the investors. Uh, we also think um, that some of the, uh, because of the sustainable finance, sustainable assets uh, for adaptation, it will be um, important to have the concessional loans it will it, it will need there will need to be grants because uh not everything will have a business case and this is something that we should know, we know and this is something that um the uh, other countries and other uh, financing bodies have have ha has to acknowledge um we also think that um that uh, the, uh, the the green climate fund when we look at their that the, the last report the the, the the percentage of the adaptation project from the whole uh, fi financing project um, contribution were, were, was very limited. So we hope that in Glasgow, uh, there will be more of um, focus on the, uh, the, the, the financing, mo financing mobilizing for the sustainable, um, the, for small island developing states. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's interesting as you, you segue into hopes and aspirations for COP26. And I know that 
representatives from all of these jurisdictions will be will be up at COP, and it would be wonderful to meet face to face in those uh, in that environment. Um, and and we don't have to deal with the the vagrancies of Zoom calls when we do that. It would be nice to meet in person. Um, I know that Isle of Man would like to come in on this point, but unfortunately, as always, time is calling is moving on. And uh, and I absolutely know that if I don't ask some of the questions that have come through on Slido, I won't be allowed to leave the building. So if you'll if you'll bear with me, I'm going to stick with the theme of costs. Um, and uh, read out what I think is one of the, the nub of some of the issues uh, that we've discussed today uh, in the form of this question here that's come through. And then I'll open it to the floor who feels brave enough to answer this one. So the question is, how are the various islands dealing with the costs of delivering net zero solutions, given that they're often more expensive than burning fossil fuels? Who would like to go with that one first? Of course, Jersey can come back into the room as well if it wishes. We've been very quiet and patient here. <laughs> can I? Please do, Pedro. Come on in. Take the plunge. <laughs> uh, very, very difficult one, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what I would like to mention is that uh, that every island has its own challenges. It's very different to when we are speaking about. Uh, uh, a close to continent island or uh, an outermost region. So uh, uh, the proximity of, uh, of uh, the continents might allow, for example, for the power grid to be connected to, to the continent. We do not have that. Uh, we do not have that ability. So for us, the challenge of, of net zero is, uh, is, is harder, uh, even, even further if, uh, if we say that uh, our forest uh, is an ancient one, so it's not really contributing for for um, sequestration. So net zero is is very hard to achieve. But uh, but the idea is not to throw the towel in. We must do whatever is in our range of capacity to to pursue net zero. Uh, even if then uh, in ten years time we uh, realize that it is not possible. For example, for energy. Um, um, security, uh, but we do as much as we can. Uh, we want to do as much as we can. So it will cost us uh, a lot. Uh, we have allocated already 40% of our regional budget towards climate change, mitigation and, uh, and adaptation. And the challenge is to, uh, um, to increase that and to do whatever we can in order to achieve net zero, either in 2040, 2050 or 2060. We have a pathway and we want to pursue it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that wants to come in on the financing question? No one's feeling particularly brave. I'm, I'm going to throw it to the... Oh, no, I'm, am I seeing a hand up? No, I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it across to the Environment Minister for Jersey. I know he's got a view that he wants to share with us. Well, it is a tough issue. Um, Jersey, obviously, um, Jersey is a, has its own unique jurisdiction. We don't have access um, to um, funds that would come from EU sources or from the United Kingdom. Uh, we have to generate our own funding solutions to, to this issue. And of course, we have, it's well known that Jersey is quite a high cost place. Costs are high. And what it's imperative, our government, our states, our parliament has made it quite plain that in this journey, we, mu we must not disadvantage those on low and median incomes. And yet the reality is, of course, there are other parts of our community that um, I believe can afford to pay. And of course, what we're seeing is as technology develops in this area and solutions become possible, then they start to become increasingly economically viable where they, where they can be self-funding, where the benefits pay for the cost. We're seeing that in a number of areas. We're seeing it in the area of solar. And I think we'll see it, we, this will progressively, it's a very exciting period that technology and industry is coming up with these novel solutions. So I think what I personally think, this is a personal view, it's, it's one that I'm going to be putting forward to our government, sorry, our states shortly, is that we need to find solutions to provide what I would call 
carrot and stick in, in our terms, which means incentives, which means that provide incentives to encourage us to start that process of transition, um, but accepting the fact that's a starter, and then to bridge the gap between the situation where those net te technologies may not stand alone uh, uh, and, may, and may pay. And I think that also means, and the reality is, providing disincentives where those changes are not made and using the system of fiscal measures to bring the two together. That's my own expectation. It's a journey and it's a transition. And um, for, for you know, our government, our term of election as members in Jersey is four years, similar in other jurisdictions, I think. And I would guess that a lot of the factors I've just spoken of are very common in smaller jurisdictions as well. Um, but I do think we have to make progress, and that is why we've set aside what we call, uh, we've set aside significant ring fence funds to start the process off. We have that already, a substantial resource in Jersey terms. I don't know if my colleague, external affairs minister, would like to add to that. <laughs> no, I mean, Louise, you're right. It, it's a really difficult area, but I do think that it's incumbent upon uh, leaders to be honest with the public uh, that it is going to cost, that it's not going to be easy, but it's absolutely crucial because the cost of tackling uh, the issues that we face now is far less than, as we heard from uh, our colleagues earlier, uh, once the environment has been devastated. The rebuilding costs from a devastated environment far outweigh the costs of taking the precautionary uh, and measures that need to be taken now. But we have to be honest with uh, our public. It is going to cost money. It is going to take time, but it is ultimately the right thing to do. And the mixture of measures that uh, John Young just spoke about are what we will have to do. I think we also have to do uh, more thinking and understanding about the implication uh, for the poorest in our communities, because it's easy uh, to glibly say that we don't want anybody to be disadvantaged, but it's much more difficult to come forward with measures uh, to ensure that is the case. And, and we know that because we look at the history of the uh, benefit that carbon generated energy has provided the great uh, raising out of poverty of swathes of our communities. This is now that what we're doing in reverse. Uh, and that's going to be really challenging. But I'm ho hopeful, Louise, as you've just said, that at COP26, we can make concrete, tangible commitments uh, to make sure that there's no going back, that we build together to everyone's benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm being told that in the interests of time, we really do have to wrap up. And I know that's a disappointment because I'm sure we'd all like to go on a little further. And I do know that there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered and some are quite Jersey specific. So I'll certainly take away that as an action to follow those up on the Slido um, for those that have particularly got a relevance to Jersey rather than to the wider group. But I know that there are questions that have remained unanswered and I don't want that to be the case. Um, so it remains for me to say thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Uh, I think this is the, I would love to think that this is the beginning of a new and really fruitful relationship. I feel that we have so many commonalities. I feel that there's the real opportunity to catch up at COP um, and perhaps to work out how we might unify our voices more formally together and certainly informally share experiences and knowledge. Uh, we hope to issue a communique at the end of today. Um, and we'll make sure that that goes out on the media and ag as agreed with all of you. But I think now is the time to say thank you very much for joining us, for sticking through the uh, technical glitches as they always are, and uh, in the hope of saying hello in person at COP26 in Glasgow at the beginning of next month. Thank you very much for coming.